Okay. Well, welcome to the first week of the R Packages Book Club, um, largely form formerly known as the Advanced R Book Club. Uh, <laughs> my dog wants to participate. So this one's going to be interesting. Um, because they are writing this book right now, the second edition, and it's fairly active occasionally. Like, it comes in bursts, and I think they are actually back in a burst where they're working on this book a bit. Um, <laughs> they don't want to come over to this side, unfortunately, so there's no view of the pups just yet. But I'm sure they'll both make appearances in the next uh, 11 weeks or so. So... Um, I, I've got a slide where I'll, I'll go to in, get into the details of the breakdown that we're looking at. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing uh, not that one, that one. So, um, all right. So, yeah, this week we're going to try to we're going to talk about why you might want to write a package, which is in chapter one of this book, and the philosophy. That motivates the uh, the packet the meta packages that they put together. Um, we're going to roughly describe the contents of each chapter of the book, and in doing that, we're going to break it down in ten suggested reading order that I think I'm in agreement with at this point. Um, and then I'm going to run through and build the package that they build in chapter two to show you and talk through how to do it. Um, I've written probably about. 30 packages now for work. Um, so I've got a little bit of experience with this uh, and hopefully I can help, I don't know, get everyone up to speed on how to write packages. So um, they talk in, in the book and I, I agree with this, <laughs> that uh, it's, you know, there are like there are the obvious reasons to write a package to share code with others to make it easy to download, install, and use that code. Um, but the other reason to write a package, which is what most of my work packages are really, is that it gives you an opinionated organization of files. That there's this structured way to do it. And the nice thing about that, some people disagree, but the nice thing about that is then you don't have to think about it. It's set up that way. There's this way of organizing things, and it's just done. Um, <laughs> and it's not as ridiculous as it sounds because like I've got a package for accessing the um, like student data in our system and I've got packages for we have packages for working with our Salesforce instance and we have a package for dealing with Jira things like that um, yeah Miles McBain is my arch nemesis because he does not like writing packages um, we'll see uh and then the other, the other reason that writing or doing things as packages is helpful is that the Tidyverse team writes things like use this and dev tools. And then there's another team that wrote good practice, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, that help you standardize everything um, and help you like do things like setting up a package and um, like using Git and GitHub and testing things and all, all that kind of thing. Um, all that said, you know, packages aren't for everything. Um, and hopefully, like, the basic one to write a package for is if you, for your work or your fun, have a bunch of functions that you use all the time or things that could be functions that you do all the time, repeated tasks. Putting that into a package just makes it easier. You don't have to find the file to copy and paste. You just use the package. Um, and so on there... And in the book, they talk about meta packages. Um, Hadley says anything that can be automated should be automated. That can definitely be taken too far. You don't want to automate things just because they can be automated. But if they're being done um, repeatedly, automating them uh, helps you avoid mistakes. And the the great there are a lot of great meta packages for package development. Um, He's going to talk a lot about dev tools and use this, which is kind of sort of like it's next to slash inside of dev tools. Um, dev tools is the meta meta package because it loads all the tidyverse meta packages basically. Um, 
but use this. That's like, I think that is the best productivity package because if you just read through the help and go, oh, it's, uh, you know, use our profile. Let me see what that does. And you run that and it'll help you set up your R profile. So our studio or just your R session works better for you or use our environment. And oh, hey, look, that'll help me set up my environment variables. Um, and you can just go through the list and it's helpful. So I like that package a lot. Um, good practice. I'm probably going to bring this in at some point later in the book to show you that this is a package I use at work, work all the time. And it runs through and does even more checks than DevTools does. Um, it helps you find uh, hard to read parts of your code. It helps you find like over complicated parts of your code. Um, it helps you with some styling stuff. And it's, uh, and then it finds things that like Cran wouldn't like about your package basically, um, which DevTools also does some of that, but good practice is good for that. Um, also it checks code coverage for testing. Um, it checks a bunch of other things. And then finally, the other package, meta package that I use a lot is Styler, which let, um, you can set up your own style or I just use the tidyverse style because whatever, good enough. And then you don't have to think about it again. You don't have to fight over how many spaces should there be in a tab, um, whether it should be two or incorrect. Um, that kind of thing. It just runs it all and deals with it. All right, so for this club, um, machete order is the, uh, the correct way to watch the Star Wars movies if you must watch the prequels. Um, and, and it's where you start with uh, the original uh, first and second movie, and then you do a little prequel to see, oh, what's, what's this all about with Vader after you find out who Vader is, and then you watch the end of the movie. Um, not necessarily right, but it's an, an alternative way to do it, and a lot of people like it. So similar to that, not necessarily right, but we, I think I'm on board with this, that for this club, we have a weird, uh, an order that does not match the current order of the book. And we'll see, because by the end of the club, maybe this will, this will end up matching the order of the book. Maybe we will convince them to or reorganize some things. We'll see. Um, so our thought is today, we're looking at chapters one and two, which are basically just why, what is this book for? What, why does this exist? Uh, next week, we're going to do three and four, which is like about getting your system ready to write a package. Uh, the work after that, why should I work on, on my package? Or how should I work on my package, rather, is about um, oops, is about workflows. And uh, what is the other uh, 18 yeah. is, oh, Git and GitHub. And then um, how do I convert a script to a package? We're going to stop and kind of do another um, sample package, but it'll be after you've gotten a little bit more into things. So I, I like that. And we're going to talk about vignettes, which are, um, an underused way of writing help. Um, then we're thinking we'll do how to write functions and document them, um, which is the meat of the book. Uh, so we're thinking we'll do two weeks, but it's better to do all three of those at the same time, we think. So it's, uh, writing code, uh, documenting it, and the namespace file, which will be auto-generated auto and mostly you don't have to think about it. Um, then we're going to talk about testing. How do I make sure my package works? Testing and automated checking. Um, how do I describe my package? That's the description file where you put your name and uh, license info. Uh, how do I include things like data in other files? That's 14 and 16. External data and in installed files. How do I use compiled code and other obscure packagey things? Um, which Tan wrote it that way, and I couldn't find a better way to say it, that it's just things like compiled code and the chapter is literally other components because it's just all the other stuff. Um, and then finally, at the end, we'll talk about releasing packages and maybe uh, we'll see, maybe we'll have a package done to release at that point. And so, uh, I'm not going to say that I'm like requiring this or anything, but I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to get to the point where we can all help on the package that Tan started that is about running book clubs for R4DS. And so this book club can help all the other book clubs. Um, and I totally, yes, I should have the meme here, um, that I heard you like book clubs. So I put a 
so I made a package to package your book club, whatever. Um, but all this might go away because the book could change. Uh, chapter nine didn't exist. A, didn't exist two weeks ago for sure. It might not have existed one week ago. Um, I mean, a chapter nine existed, but the licensing chapter did not exist. And Tan just found some, their notes on GitHub today of all the stuff that Hadley and Jenny are discussing for how to totally rearrange the book. Um, that might sound like it's going to be annoying, but the cool thing is um, they very grace, graciously accept pull requests on suggestions on things in their books. And um, if we find, you know, if you are working on a presentation and find something that you think could be better, you can pull request it and then they will uh, thank you in the book. And that's pretty cool. Um, all right. So, um, I'm not going to jump into this yet because first I think we should do some housekeeping. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Um, in theory, stop share. There we go. So I ran through everything really quick. Does anyone have any questions about the basic setup other than what might be in chat? Uh, <laughs> Don't tell me you're going to use foo factors as the name of the package. I am because then I can copy uh, and paste things and it doesn't break. Um, I yeah. Earlier I did it without it being the same name and it made some things harder. So, uh, But I am going to talk through why to do some of the steps. Uh, the, only, the other thing I wanted to just bring up and we can talk about it in the chat, but I went with this time slot because this is what we've been meeting at. Um, it's not set in stone. So if people have a better, like have a problem with this time slot, we can talk about it and we'll probably talk about it just in general, but it's been working. So probably we'll be here next week, 7 p.m. CDT. All right. Um, I am going to do the first step that they list here of create package because when you run that, it uh, restarts your uh, R Studio session. Um, oops. And then it will change the window that is being shared. So foo factors. Um, oops, from use this. All right. Share screen. Oops, share screen. Foo factors. All right. So I, I just ran that one command, create package uh, dot dot slash foo factors. And that creates an RStudio project, which is super helpful to keep everything or not organized. And it puts all the stuff in the right places. Um, this is an example of where use this is super helpful because it just does the stuff for you. Um, and let's make sure that I don't have anything else. Okay, yeah. So that's all set up. And then the next thing they do, uh, well, I'm going to now that my session is restarted. Um, actually, library dev tools, which would have library use this for me because they don't tell me which package some of these things are in. And so I don't want to have to run it. Um, Next thing they point out is that we should use Git, which I totally agree with. So I'm going to say yes. Um, if you haven't used Git, we are going to have a, you know, there's a week that's about two things, but it's mostly going to be about Git. Uh, it's just a way to track changes um, and helps with collaboration. And usually if you're working on a package at some point, um, oh, it's going to restart. Hopefully it won't blow up the uh, share. Nope. Okay. I think I'm still sharing that. Is that correct? Is that, all right. Um, but the, uh, it, like it helps you coordinate when you're working with other people is the, is one of the main useful things about Git. Also helps you, even if you're only working with yourself, that 
uh, when you make a mistake, you can roll it back and it you don't like lose everything. And that's so, that's really nice. Um, so for this package, what we're going to do is it's, it's all about um, combining factors that factors are confusing sometimes because when you try to combine two factors until um, a week and a half from now, it breaks and I'm waiting to see what they're going to do this chapter because the next version of R actually fixes this. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see. But for now, we're going to uh, make it so that when you when we combine factors, or we're going to make a function that we can combine factors and it doesn't turn them into an integer, uh, a vector of integers. And so the example that he has, I'm not going to, I'm just, well, I'll go ahead and define it, is this fbind function. And the idea is now if I fbind a, b, then it just puts it together as a factor. What it actually does, who cares? Because we're looking at the structure of a package. All right. And this this step, so I'm, I'm doing it the way he does it in the uh, in the book. Um, personally, I, I am on board with the idea of test-driven devel development, and we'll talk about that in later chapters. But the... Oh, <laughs> right, I did that already. Oh no, because it reset, restarted when I used git. That's why. All right, so um, this use r, all it does is it puts this f bind, this thing that I named it, into the right um, folder with the right name. But the reason, and we're gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead to, um, oops, to a later thing that later we're gonna use test that. And the reason that use R is cool is now I can say I use test and I don't have to specify anything. And it sees that I have fbind open. And so it just creates the test file that goes with the fbind file. Um, but like the correct way to do that in my mind is you do that, which creates the test file, you create your tests, and then you say use R and write the code to actually make the test pass, but whatever. Um, can do it in either direction. And what they show us is let's just put that function into this use or this fbind uh, .r file. And then there is the function in DevTools load all, which actually isn't going to work because I haven't vibrated DevTools. Um, Oh, and I'm going to clear my environment. Actually, no, I'm going to just all right, find because I want A and B. There we go. Um, and now nothing changed in my environment. I don't actually see a function because we haven't actually exported it. But load all is this thing in DevTools that just loads all, everything that's in this package I'm working on. Um, you can also run load all with control shift L in uh, our studio. That is useful to know because I do that about a thousand times a day to just load the package that I'm working on. Um, and so now that one, now that I've done that, I can find AB and okay, it exists. It's in my uh, environment or I guess he shows, um, shows actually it's not in my environment but it's loaded it's in my search path but it's not in, in the global environment so oh and then the next step that we're going to do is we're going to commit it um he says use your favorite whatever i my favorite is just the r studio ID, uh, ide because then i don't have to learn all those git commands that everyone complains about checkbox on them and say, you know, um, getting funky that I've got my package. And now that is committed. And the next step is again, this is from DevTools. So check to see um, what's wrong with the package. And he's gonna tell you that you should have one note, or sorry, one warning and no notes, but let's see because the server they use for checking the time was has been down all day. Yes, so we have a note because it's unable to verify the current time. Um, 
we can ignore that note, but it's telling us, oh no, the um, there's an invalid license pointer. And this is actually a little bit different than the warning that um, that he says you'll see because I've got some things in my R profile to automatically set up some things. So, so but what we're gonna do now is we're gonna edit this description file and he shows us some tips on what to put. Um, but again, we can see that because I use use this, this is just auto filled with my name and my uh, work ID and my email. Um, use this is super useful. And we will, when we get to that chapter, if not before, talk about how to set it up to be that, that useful. I mean, actually, we'll, I'll show you that in just a second. So I'm going to fill in the stuff that he says that and okay. So now we're, we're basically done. Um, I mean, we've not done, but we've got a working description and I'll show you real quick. Um, nope, let's do, let's edit our profile. That's right. Uh, that I have it set up that it knows my full name. It knows this authors.r thing. It says I, or it knows that I like to use MIT license, um, which is funny because I have this file license part of it, which means I still have to run like he tells us to do next, use MIT license just to put that file in there. But because I have this set up, it knows to put my name in there, which is convenient. Um, and it, oh, just to, to back up on the clarity, yes, we are just flying through everything tonight. And the point is, this is the entire book. We are going through the whole book. So no, don't try to learn everything yet, but the you just need to see it once is the goal here. All right, so we use the MIT license. Um, we're gonna go ahead and document, but it doesn't do anything because there's nothing to document. And so that's where he goes through and shows us um, that if you just do this cool, <laughs> um, there's a command in our studio. I don't actually even know where to find it because it's actually you just go to the beginning of the function and you hit control shift, control alt shift R. And it fills in a skeleton. Uh, again, I do it many, many times a day. So I don't even know where to find it in menus anymore. Um, it, it's, code insert Roxygen skeleton apparently. Um, or you just copy and paste what he shows us in the book. Whoa, that was weird for a second. And now, so this weird, these, this weird thing with the hashtag quote um, tells this package Roxygen2 that this is help docs for this file or for this function. And now when we run document, there's stuff that happened over in my Git panel there that it just auto-generated documents for this function. And you can kind of see, again, we're going to talk about it in detail, but you can see there's like this short description, a an actual like paragraph description, definition of the parameters that are in there. Um, he did not define them very clearly, but whatever. Um, return a factor. And then importantly, we say that we're going to export it. Um, so now, see what does he tell us to do he said to document it yeah and if we like do the help ref bind it actually has help now which is kind of cool because we didn't have to write a full you know a fancy file to get all this description and usage and arguments and whatever um and if we look at this auto-generated namespace file we can see that it says export f bind that's just the thing that tells R, hey, the, export this function. And when we run check again, um, we're just going to get that one note, presumably. Yeah, so now no warnings. We get the one note because the server's down, but that's it. And we can actually install this package. And in theory, it installed. Um, it's got a description file. It's got some help here. 
So it's in our system. All right, and then, oh yeah, and we can library it. Actually, already library it here, but whatever. And now when we say a find a, B, um, it's there. And if I go back up to that, um, the exists thing, think. Oh, no, it doesn't exist in the global because it's, again, it's an exported pointer from the package. All right. Install. All right, now he's telling us to use test that, which I already did, and I used. Um, you can either say use test find, or again, if you have the fbind.r file open, use test just automatically go, creates and opens that test. Um, the funny thing about use test is it it auto fills with this test that you never want. Um, but it shows you the basic structure. So I guess that's useful. And the idea is test that is this package that um, lets you test functions really easily. You say, you know, these are my given things. And um, and then I expect that when I do F bind, it creates Z. Or when I do F bind of X as a factor in Y, it also creates Z. And so um, I am going to Oh, yeah, he says to library test that, so we'll do it this way. And then we can execute that. And it, when test that works, it doesn't do anything. So if we say, you know, expect identical this and that, it, tells, it shows, throws you an error. Or if I run this whole thing now, it tells me that there's an error. And it tells me a little bit about what's wrong. This package uh, has a version three that's about to release that um, tells you a lot more about what's wrong. In this context, obviously it's easy. Like you said this and you said you were gonna get this and you actually got that. But when you've got some like big data frame and one value in one column changed, uh, right now it's pretty bad at telling you that. And the next edition um, is really good at that, plus a bunch of other things, but that was the one that I, I'm excited for because I do a lot of tests to make sure that I selected data properly. And uh, sometimes one thing changes because the underlying data changed. And when the, it just says, nope, those aren't the same, it's a pain. So I'm looking forward to when it'll actually tell us exactly what's wrong. Um, the other way you can do this is in our studio under build, there is test package or control shift T and that runs your tests and gives you this pretty uh, output of yes, everything is, um, is working great. All right. Next, we are going to add a package dependency. So we're going to use the package for cats, um, which is a member of the tidyverse that's all about uh, factors. It's for categoricals for cats. And we are going to write a new function f count. Um, and again, I'm just going to copy paste. It does a thing that uh, makes frequency table for a factor. But the important part is when you use a function from another package, you either have to do the full namespace where you put the uh, double colon, or you have to tell it that you're going to import from for cats um, fact count. And he will probably tell us, I can't remember if he actually goes into why to use one versus the other. I always use this format. Technically, if you're going to import something over and over, importing it once is slightly better because this takes like a microsecond or something. So if you're going to import it over and over and over, doing this call um, adds a little bit of time to your package, but otherwise it's exactly the same. So now we'll load all again. And now we are going to, oh, I'm not gonna use his example. I'm going to do penguins 
penguins species because that is a better data set. And it shows us the counts of the factors. It's exciting. All right, and uh, we're gonna document. And again, this is a thing we will see later, but really I like to always set up my packages to generate documentation with Roxygen and do it every time I install and restart this package. And then control shift B installs the package and regenerates the documentation. And now it's all pretty, it's library and I can do that and do F count. And there we go, there's the, the package. Um, the next thing he goes into in the book is using GitHub, but just like he does in the book, I don't want to show that because that'll make, that's messy. So we'll talk about that later. Um, a final piece or getting close to final at least is especially if you are putting this on GitHub, having a readme that tells what the package is all about is helpful. And so this use readme RMD sets up your GitHub um, readme. And this is the one part where calling this pack package foo factors is helpful because he refers to foo factors repeatedly in this sample help doc or um, readme. Um, so the idea in a readme, uh, they, I mean, there are lots of things you can do with it, but the general idea is to tell people how your package works. So we do that and then we build, which I didn't even know was a function until I read this. What that will do is make sure that it's working with the version of the package that you have here, even if you don't have it installed. And it generates the readme.md. If we look at the files. So that's the, actually the file that GitHub is ex expecting. Um, that's it. And then we're going to do another check and then we're going to install it. I think, yeah, that's the end of the chapter. So we just built a package. Um, it actually has two foot functions. They're not useless. Um, it has help. It has, it's got uh 50% test coverage. So that's not awful. Um, it's better than a lot of, uh, release packages actually. And, um, it works. So, I mean, I assume you have a lot of questions because that's the whole book club, but do you have any kind of littler questions <laughs> or anything that anyone wants? If you don't have questions, um, I am curious if, uh, if anyone's coming here with like a plan for what they would like to package up and aren't sure yet how to do that. So if anyone wants to let us know. What's going to be a data driven package? Uh, right now, I don't have any functions in it. Okay. But that was going to be one of my questions is, does a package need functions? No. Um, a lot of times, if it's just data, there can be possibly better ways to deal with it, except it does make it easier to, you know, you can install it in R and then you've got the data there. A lot of times what I'll do, I, I have a, um, I have had one or two cases of just data and I still put like a function in the package that is, um, you know, maybe it'll like uh, sort the data in some way or something like that, just so it feels a little bit more like a normal package. Um, but yeah, that is a thing you can do with packages for sure. Okay. And if I do write functions, is it good practice to have one function per script or can you uh, put multiple ones in one script? You can put, so he has a whole part where he's going to talk about that, but the, um, the general rule of thumb that the tidyverse team uses is kind of like one like uh, roughly one help doc per script. So if you have a bunch of functions that are going to go into one help doc, you put them all in the one script. Um, but I say rule, and that's really, really, really not a rule. Sometimes they'll have 
you know, 20 un or only vaguely related functions to fi find in one script. Um, I still change my mind about how, like I reorganize my scripts all the time in my packages. Uh, it's not definitely not a hard and fast rule. Okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs> but we'll talk about that in chapter seven, which is, I don't remember which week, four or five, three, somewhere in there. Um, does anyone else have an idea of something? What, what is or, your opinion on uh, utils.r? <laughs> uh, I use it often. Um, it depends. So it, he'll talk about that a bit too. But a lot of times people will have just a utils.r in the R folder where you just throw all the stuff that you're not going to export that you use in a bunch of other functions inside of your package. Um, it's not a bad idea. Um, he, I mean, we'll look at it when we get to that chapter, but he talks about how um, Bob Rudis did a whole blog post where he did an analysis of everyone's utils.r in a bunch of different packages to see what kind of things people normally put into their unexported functions. Um, because a lot of those, like, uh, like Arlang, I'm pretty sure started out as the tidyverse utils.r. And they're like, oh, let's, let's like unify this and make one thing that all of our packages use instead of rewriting these things over and over. So. Okay, second question. Like how, when you're developing packages, it's pretty iterative, right? Like you're, most of the time you're not gonna have like a single idea and like kind of go through and like, yeah. you know, showcase this where, you know, you had, knew exactly what the functions you wanted to do and it was a nice clean cycle of it. Uh, like how ugly is it normally <laughs> for me oh it's it's extremely ugly um which can get to be a bit of a headache for me at this point because uh thanks to the advanced r book club i have twice in the last like two three months made major changes to a package to packages that are used by all of my packages at work but it was worth it because they're so much better now and so I've had to go through all my packages and make sure that they still work with the changes. Um, that's something that we might get into towards the end it, um, <laughs> if I've had more time to play with it. But things like, uh, well, um, Yanni CD, who I do some development with for R4DS, has this whole Slack universe of packages. And he has it set up that when he makes a change in one of them, GitHub automatically tests all the downstream packages and tells him, oh, this other package broke with the change you just made. Um, so that is a thing you can set up and I really need to get that kind of thing set up at work because that's really nice. John, you said you have 30 packages at work. I'm curious what, um, you know, uh, why you split them up into 30 and they started as one huge, huge package and they started to divvy it out or? Um, a little, so some of them have actually merged back together. Some of them have been deprecated because um, they're old data that we don't work with or I simplified some things. Um, but mostly, it, uh, well, a lot of the stuff I personally write is for um, accessing kind of categories of data and like, um, you know, I, I want a function that is for uh, getting a list of courses and courses have properties that I want to look at. And so, um, you know, instead of having it be that I have to then filter the data or the table that's generated, I give it parameters in the function that changes the search or the query that it runs on the database to get just the courses that I'm looking for. Um, and then like I have, well, I have a package, I have a meta package for dealing with our database. I have a meta package for dealing with our data dictionaries and putting them into the format that all my other packages use. Um, we have our, uh, our core package that all of our packages use that's just validate the inputs so that we get better error messages when someone accidentally puts the wrong kind of uh, 
argument into one of the arguments of a function. So lots of little pieces, um, but I admit some of them have like gotten too far apart and merged back together. Uh, I ha I don't have a good rule yet of when to make a separate package. I go back and forth because, I, and I'm probably about to get a lot more strict about it because I am doing much more with um, getting close to having it all worked out to set up uh, Amazon Lambda uh, servers, serverless, whatever, serverless functions to run our code on demand on a little teeny tiny server that you want to be able to set up, spin up and down. And for that case, I want to, I want those servers to only have the minimum set of data or minimum set of packages. And therefore I want things to be more split up because I don't want the stuff I'm not actually using to be on that server. Um, so there are, you know, extreme cases where you care I think for your first thing, probably just make your one giant package. And then if it gets to a point where that package is too big to deal with, split it up. Um, it's, it's not that hard to split and recombine despite everything I was just saying there. So that's part of why I think I've changed my mind a couple of times. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll just split this off. Have to make these downstream changes, but it's no big deal. And then later I'll be like, oh, you know what? I, I'm always librarying both of those packages. So I should probably just put them back together into one. And Tan, I know you've written some packages or at least one, one and a half. How about, do you write more? I, so I was gonna tell you, I was gonna say something like, John just starts with a package and then like decides that it's not a package rather than the other way around, because he's a it's, project as packaged person. Um, I'm, I'm I, really project as is vignette, but still. <laughs> that's the same thing, dude. <laughs> um, I I definitely, like, I, I have one for work now, along with the, like, the fantasy scraper one that I started after uh, reading Advanced R. Um, and I already had, like, a miscellaneous package. So, you know, it. I I start with, like, it needs to like do a certain set of stuff, um, and that bucket can either shrink or you know, like shrink or get bigger. Um, but like all my work-related, work-specific stuff stays in one package. All of my fantasy football-related stuff stays in one package. And as I like get it closer to some kind of production level, I decide what scope it has. Um, but certainly, I start. You know, you start and finish a lot of stuff, and some stuff never takes off. So. Um, yeah, it's, scoping is interesting, um, and you know you, you should decide what your package will and won't do at some point, um, but it doesn't have to be before you start the package. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> John, I have a question about um, making new versions. In the description file, it comes out with default. 0.0.0.9000 0 .0 that it says, you know, guidance for updating minor versions and patches and all that at the end. When you do that, do you manually change the description file and then count on Git version control to keep track of the old versions that worked before you start messing with a new version? Or what's the best workflow for that? Uh, I usually will, um, so we, we tend to do it like feature-based updates so, or feature or bug level. And we do the, we have rules at work that, that basically one coworker and I are the big R developers and we've set up all the rules of what the version means. Um, the short answer is, uh, you know, we, we up the version on the new, uh, for the new change. And then you have to deal with uh, there are various ways to deal with versioning <laughs> from there, just like any other R package. But as far as GitHub, like um, actually you can set up GitHub actions or that kind of thing to enforce versioning. I haven't done that and I probably should because that is a common uh, thing. Um, <laughs> the, the, the team of R devs, it's me and one other guy. So just to be clear, <laughs> But um, a, a common thing that we have a checklist that we do when we're um, checking, when we're making a pull request in GitHub and the first thing, or one of the first things is, did you increment the version? It's like, oh, 
no, and I have to do a new commit to uh, increment the version. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, like I say, I'm hoping before the end of this club to be better at GitHub Actions because that's a thing GitHub Actions should be able to check, I would think, um, and yell at me if I don't do that. Or even don't just yell at me, possibly just make me say whether this is a bug fix or a new feature or a major release and then just increment it. That'd be cool. Um, but yeah, there isn't, uh, at least there's nothing that I use that is really good at version, um, package version checking. And actually, uh, they're about to, so test that version three, they're also calling it edition three. And there's a thing that you set to tell uh, your packages to use the third edition of test that because they, they're making huge breaking changes that would break thousands of packages. They don't wanna do that. So they basically have two versions of the package inside of test that version three. Um, we'll see what happens uh, when that comes out, if it changes how things work in R, because that's a weird concept. They're not sure yet. I'm not even 100% sure it'll actually still be there when they release it, but they had a webinar about the new version and it, it it's exciting. It looks great if you do a lot of package development, but it's very, it's very, very big changes. Um, and again, you know, like probably a large percentage of packages that are on CRAN use test that. So they're like, we can't change it. It breaks all of CRAN if we, if we break it. Um, so that'll be interesting. <laughs> can, I, can I chime in about how we do our version control? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so we have a pretty active um, a group of people submitting issues. So we have a sprint planning meeting. I think there's yep. about six of us who develop nice. um, our, our, our package. So we have a sprint planning meeting every month and we'll pick the, so we use the projects and milestones within GitHub. So it creates a Kanban board. Right. Um, so we'll put things onto the board. People will uh, take on the issues that they want to work on. And at the end of the month, we kind of see how far we got. And then we we try to do one, one release a month. So just a, a minor, incrementing like in, in minor minor steps um and that that's worked pretty well so we you mentioned something called bump version what does that do yeah so you can in that you can say bump uh, a major version a minor version or a bug fix and then it will just add the the number onto that counter so if it was 1.0.0 and you said bump major it'd be 2.0 if it was 0 0.1.0, it'd be 0 0.2.0. So it's it's like a nice way to, to do that. So I have like my, I have a little script that I use to um, everything that needs to, to happen every time I'm going to um, like fix an issue. And then I have another script for every time we're going to uh, release a new version. So in that one, it's like increase the version, spell check everything. I guess I always spell check, but um, yeah, we a list of steps that we go through, update the, the news, that kind of thing. But, Thanks. That's and the there's also, use yeah, use this has use version or uh, use dev version. Use dev version just text the 9000 on the end. Um, and use, use version lets you say major minor uh, bug fix, I think. Major minor patch dev. A patch. patch. Um, and I, I also like manually edit the description file, even though I know that function is there because I, I, n I never think of it until after I've, I'm already editing something else or whatever. I don't know. Um, and then Tyler's just living on the edge. Um. <laughs> I, I have a, just like more of a thought on packages in general and like kind of combining them with uh, data analysis. So I guess that's most of my stuff is more like project data analysis stuff, but I try to you know, structure the directory as like a package. Um, I don't really ever end up like uh, creating a formal package, but I have it there in the same structure as a package. Um, and it, I, so I don't, yeah, I don't really like have standalone packages. I'll end up just like copying like a single file with like the database accessing functions, you know, over to every project. 
because uh, you know sometimes things change on the back end with the, what the uh, database administrators are doing. So I had to yep. change something in that. So it's like a way of versioning it a little bit. And I know it's kind of like manual-ish by just <laughs> kind of treating each of them as separately. Um, but I don't know. I feel like that solution makes sense. It's almost like archiving changes over time, you know, I guess without Git necessarily, and making right. sure that, you know, that code works as it was at that time. Um, yeah, I know there's more formal solutions for that, but, you know, <laughs> team of one, I can get away with that. Um, right. Yeah, even, so, like, there are things you can get away with on a team of one, but also remember that you're also working with both past you and future you. And those guys just are awful to work with. So I'm still a fan of being really formal about documentation and trying to have rules for how to do versioning and everything. Because um, if I set those rules, then future me knows what the heck I was thinking. And otherwise, he has no idea. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that's I, I do. I'm. I do everything, like if I'm doing some analysis for something, whatever I'm doing, I, I do it as a vignette in a package. And then sometimes I'll find, oh, but I actually need, like I need to combine these two other packages. So maybe I'm gonna make a package that merges these three packages together that imports all three of them. And so then I'll make a new package, put the vignette over there, um, that sort of thing. But I, I and go ahead. No, go ahead and finish your uh, that. Just that I, uh, I'm a big fan of vignettes. We're going to get to them in a few weeks. They're not used in every package, but they're really nice because the, in a normal package, the idea is kind of just showing you a full path of how you use this package, and it'll show a bunch of different functions and how you use them together or whatever. But for my work packages, just writing, you know, an actual example analysis or something that I'm actually working on, I just write it as a vignette. And then as I'm writing code, like if I write too much code in the vignette, I'm like, oh, I guess that's a new function. And so I'll just make that a function in the package. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Do you use Roxygen outside of creating packages? Some of my coworkers have started putting Roxygen documentation in their own and just like one-off scripts. I don't. But also, I'm really anal about doing everything in packages, so I don't understand this concept of outside of packages. Um, how does Rock? How does, it, how does that even work outside of a package? I, did they update it? Because I know that previously, like that didn't really work very well. I don't. I don't personally do it, so yeah. I'm not sure. But I think with it starting with the 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 hashtag or I don't know pound sign, it it should just comment it out in a regular .r file. Yeah. Were you noticing something else going on? I've never tried to do it either. I just remember one time I was reading some something on Stack Overflow. Someone was trying to do that. It was actually the guy that did like the the modules, which is kind of like he doesn't like our packages. He likes like the the modules because he can. He just likes the way it works. He's trying to add. He really, but he liked the inline documentation. He was having issues. I don't know if I think there was some hack that used like Dev Tools load all or like uses like Dev Tools load all to like give you development documentation for his modules, but it was a whole ridiculous hack. I wonder if they updated it. Uh, you can probably find it somewhere. I'm trying, I think modules was um, uh, Kirill Mueller, I think. And he has been, I think, brought into the fold. Cause he's working, like he helped on, uh, what was it? Does he work on? Arlang now he works on some something really core to the tidyverse. So I think maybe they they converted him. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Conrad Rudolph's the guy's name. Oh, okay, okay. TBI, Different. I think, is what you're thinking about, John. Well, I mean, he does that for sure, but he's also I've seen he's been doing a lot more too. Um, but he might have been just the other modules guy. <laughs> Well, cool. You have hex stickers for all of the packages you've written? I have Any? one hex sticker for all of them. Um, he has so, one work hex yeah. sticker. <laughs> That's the work hex sticker. Oh, Zoom is trying to make it disappear. Woo. Anyway, so. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's funny. I do have, I have hex stickers for things that, you know, 
I don't have places to go to give them out. I've got my my shiny Tidy Tuesday. Oh, how do I get one of those? Eventually, I'm going to send them to everybody because I can't give them to people. So, and then we wrote um, Jonathan, who I work with, and I wrote an R version. Oh, there we go. An R version of Bert Google's uh, natural language processing thing. Oh wow. Um, we, uh, that one's like <laughs> that one's really confusing. Zoom. That was cool. Um, and I've got the non shiny versions of them too, and I've got. Uh, Magnets, Tidy Tuesday magnets, all kinds of things for all the conferences I'm going to go to this year. Um, <laughs> yep. All right. Well, on that note. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. So just wanted to talk through some uh, admin-y things. Yes. Um, I don't know if you were going to do that or not. So sorry uh, I was going that. to tell you to, well, uh, yeah, same that we have a meeting next week and the goal is for it to be over chapters three and four system setup, package structure and state. Um, is anyone really uh, gung ho interested or not even gung ho, just interested in, in looking into that. Uh, one thing I will say is with this club, I am very willing to help every week, but I don't think it's useful if I present every week. Um, so there's that. <laughs> I can do it, John. Excellent. All right. And we shall, uh, we shall see that. I, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the stuff we're doing in the repo. Um, but basically just do the presentation just like for advanced R. Uh, and this one, I assume we'll have some hands-on demonstration, but we'll see. Whatever you decide to do will be great. Um, do you have anything else, Tan? Yeah, so um, John is working very hard um, and <laughs> on a on the book down. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly okay. if that's possible. Um, but I know most of you are either in a book club right now or um, have already been through the Advanced Art Book Club. Uh, I need permissions, John. All right. Uh... All right, you should be able to share now, in theory. Okay, so just kind of briefly, um, we're gonna store most, we're gonna try to keep this up to date. I'm usually the maintainer, um, most because I get distracted very, very easily. Um, so I am very fast at responding to these things. Um, we're going to try to maintain this re this repository of everything. So we're going to try to put all the presentations in presentations. Um, we got rid of the data thing. And new this time from previous um, book clubs, we're, we're, we're trying to set up this book down. Um, and we're going to start actually like having learning objectives and collecting the questions and answers. So the question and answer part was already there. Um, but this time, John's got an objective to write learning objectives for each chapter. Um, so that's going to be stored here. Um, and this also has kind of the suggested order and why we think that's a suggested order. Um, I did come up with the order. We can discuss it, you know, if you, the week before, if you think, you know, hey, this would be a good idea or, hey, this doesn't make sense to me yet. Um, it's a good idea. Just put it in the Slack and we can talk about it. Um, but basically this book down, um, hopefully you guys have a peek at it every week just to kind of have familiarity with this is what the learning objective looks like um, and see if there's any questions and answers from the previous week um, that we can kind of take care of and make sure um, everybody is on the same page. So we're trying to keep this book down more up to date than in the past um, <laughs> and try to set up some learning objectives beforehand, just make sure that we all get through what we think we should get through. Um, and yeah, so to sign up, um, I've kind of got two videos on how to, you know, claim presentation on the web and also how to set up your GitHub on your um, local machine to commit changes like a slide deck um, to the repository. Um, so if you haven't done that before, I suggest you check those out. And we've got our first presenter for next week, so that's cool. And I think that was it. Just basic admin 
stuff. <laughs> and if you do go look at that, I talked even faster than I thought I would. Uh, if you do go look at that, uh, I just noticed, Tan, that we have a conflict between. Um, we've changed the order a couple times on three versus week three and week four. Um, yeah. So we'll have to just <laughs> figure that out, preferably before next week. Um, and and we are, week, yeah. yeah, yeah, and we are very, very open to changing. And like I said, the um, the book's probably going to change as we're working on it. Um, so, you know, feel free to talk about, hey, I think we should cover this chapter, not that chapter, that kind of thing. All right. Cool, cool. All right, well, I'll see everybody in the Slack and always feel free to ping me if you have any questions. Oh, I guess that's one more um, thing that I'm gonna test it out and then I'm gonna just pin it in the channel that in theory, this Zoom should start every week at this time and auto record even if I can't make it. And so we won't have to be scrambling for a Zoom room for the meeting, I think. Um, so we'll figure that out to be sure, but I think so. I think we got it now. Um, magic. Yes. Well, magic in the form of I just paid for a Zoom account because I wanted this stuff to work. <laughs> Still magic. Yes. Money is magic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. I will see you guys in Slack. Bye. See you again.